okay. Live on Facebook. Hi everyone, welcome. Get going in a couple of minutes here. Webinar, a fascinating webinar upcoming on releasing gazelles into the wild here in Israel. Hi, uh, Miroslav in Belgrade. P please, people, feel free to say hello and uh, let us know where you're from in the chat. And uh, questions about the webinar, you can write uh, in the questions and answer feature or if you write them in the chat, we'll try to get to all of them uh, throughout the webinar, we'll answer them or after. But welcome everyone, welcome Hillary in London. See, we're already at uh, close to 50 participants and in, in rising all over. Upstate New York, near Binghamton, Ottawa, South London. Welcome from everywhere. Always like to see the Berkshires. It's my neck of the woods where I grew up. Florida, Jerusalem, heard of that place. Hi, Amanda. And we're live on Facebook as well. <clears throat> Welcome Facebook crowd. And uh, everybody else coming in from Newton, Mass, of course. And uh, Burnmouth, south coast of the UK. Hello, Rosalind. Okay, Hi, Shoshana well. Feinsilber. Oh, Shoshana, great. Hello, hello. Charlottesville. Michael in Brooklyn. Welcome, everybody. We'll get moving in a minute or two here. Respect the time of those who came. But uh, give a people a minute, a minute or two to sign up, get that Zoom muscle working. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm glad everybody's Zoom muscle is not tired out from this endless pandemic. Cape Cod, Rehovo, Micanopy, Florida, near University of Florida, animal biologist. Interesting. Lester in Johannesburg. Kibbutz RL. Yeah, that's our own Barry. Barry, next time you can be a panelist. Rod. All right, I think uh, maybe we'll just get going now. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jay Shofit, uh, Director of Development and Partnerships for Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. I'm coming to you from my home in Tel Aviv. Uh, with us today, a fascinating uh, couple of people who are doing just a fascinating job in their uh, daily lives, uh, Yael Hammerman Solar and uh, Omer Darel. Um, I'll be introducing them in a second, uh, but meanwhile, just welcoming you to this webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, our project of releasing gazelles to the wild. We actually raise them in the heart of Jerusalem in a fascinating place called Gazelle Valley. We've done a couple, three webinars about that in the past. You may be familiar with it. It was an incredible uh, struggle that we had against uh, developers uh, over a decade to uh, keep this wild area of Jerusalem, right in the heart of Jerusalem, a, uh, a wild land, but also an urban park. And the gazelles breed there in a small urban core and people enjoy the place free of charge, dawn to dusk. All kinds of communities in Jerusalem come out to Gazelle Valley Park and they watch the gazelles grow up there and little by little we've succeeded in a returning of the wild. That's what we're gonna talk about today. I'll just mention uh, we have a couple upcoming webinars. We're, this is something we do every, every couple weeks um, and uh, we've been doing it since March of, uh, since April of the beginning of COVID in 2020. Um, we have uh, our own CEO, Iris Han, 
will be coming to us. Uh, I think it's a three week break actually um, because of Hanukkah uh, and Thanksgiving, but she'll be speaking on the 12th of December. That's rescheduled this Sunday, um, three weeks from today, uh, December 12th, 8 p.m. in the evening at Yuri Khan, our CEO at SPNI was in Glasgow. She's coming back, uh, she's back with perspectives on uh, climate change uh, globally and in Israel. And uh, a week after that, uh, you might have seen Alon Tal was scheduled. Javier Knesset, member of Knesset and leading environmentalist Alon Tal, he'll be with us in January. And on the 19th of December, Dan Alone, our new deputy CEO for Nature Protection, uh, will be with us. So, and those will all be on the webinars. The, the webinars will all be listed on uh, an email that you get, you got uh, today, three hours ago. And uh, we send them out once a week or so with updates and reminders. So please keep posted. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm not keeping up with the chat, but I see we're up to close to hundred people already on the Zoom and I don't know, probably more on Facebook. So it's close to five after. I wanna thank everybody for joining, um, for supporting us. I wanna thank our um, hardworking board members uh, who are here in uh, North America and the United States, Canada, the UK, France. Uh, appreciate everybody's support. Uh, and uh, an interest in our work. Hi from New Mexico and uh, all the places that I missed. But, uh, you know, write your questions and uh, introduce yourselves. We'll get to know you and uh, we hope to see you next time and in the future. Meanwhile, I will introduce uh, Yael Hammerman Solar. Yael is the director of Gazelle Valley Park in Jerusalem. Fascinating place. She's a former senior um, official of the environmental ministry in Israel. Uh, studied architecture, uh, urban and regional planning. Uh, we are thrilled to have her with us today. She's also an expert on uh, urban uh, water systems, hydrology, I'm not exactly sure, but relates to what's going on in Gazelle Valley uh, directly. So, uh, so much interesting going on there. Thank you everybody for joining and uh, Yael, take it away. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm very happy and excited to be here today. Um, I met you all um, in other webinars when I was uh, walking with you in the park while uh, in, in, in several and two other uh, uh, times when uh, some of us were had to stay at home because of the Corona. Um, so today I'm here from my house in Ramat Raziel and I'm very excited uh, to talk to you um, about the Release Gazelle project that we've been do, trying to do for the last uh, two, three years. And happy to say that in the last uh, three months, we've succeeded to release uh, seven gazelles from uh, Gazelle Valley Park uh, to the Golan Heights. Uh, we have here with us the um, uh, re-endorsing project manager, manager Omer Darel, who is going to talk to you about uh, this amazing project. Um, Omer, um, tell us all about the project and uh, we'll have a half an hour presentation and then we'll be happy to answer some questions. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Omer Dorel. Uh, talking to you from my apartment here in Jerusalem. Okay, yeah, hello everyone, are you seeing uh, the presentation probably, properly, the PowerPoint? Yes, yeah. okay. we see it. So I am, uh, uh, again, I'm Omar Darel. I'm uh, the head of uh, the reintroduction program uh, here in Gazelle Valley. Uh, outside of my work in the park, I'm a research student in the Hebrew University. And my main research interests are urban nature and conservation, which relates to our topic for today. Uh, today, I will tell you about the mountain gazelles in, of Israel and how one community in Jerusalem united to protect their local urban, urban nature site and the gazelles reside in it. I will tell you about how this small population of gazelles, which was long considered doomed, uh, was rehabilitated, stabilized, and has now become the foundation of a reintroduction program aiming to support other populations of this endangered species. Uh, this is the mountain gazelle, named in Hebrew Tzvi Israeli, the Israeli gazelle, the mountain gazelle are the only large herbivore that remained common throughout the entire non-arid parts of Israel and has therefore become a symbol for Israeli wildlife. Uh, however, this species is facing a worldwide crisis. It is considered by the IUCN as an endangered species. 
with world population size comparable to species such as tigers or black rhinos. And uh, the most recent population estimate is uh, 5,000 individuals and almost all of them are in Israel. Uh, this animal significance does not stem solely out of its endangerment. Gazelles have been central to this land's culture uh, for millennia, basically. Uh, from uh, up here, you can see prehistoric uh, rock carvings and uh, Roman and Byzantine mosaics. Uh, it is also heavily featured in uh, the Bible, the Jewish Bible. Uh, Hatsvi uh, is usually a symbol of beauty and grace, uh, like you can see in the romantic poetry of Shira Shirim. Domedo di Letzvi or Ofer Ayali. My beloved resembles a gazelle. Uh, however, uh, it was sometimes the word Tzvi sometimes used to uh, describe certain attributes. Uh, for example, in the book well, of Ezekiel. Well, I have yes. to stop you for a minute. Uh, we have uh, people are asking for you to, to speak a little bit more slowly. <laughs> ah, sorry. Yeah, I have that problem. Okay. Another example in uh, the book of Ezekiel, Yechezkel is a uh, uh, glory of all land, speaking about uh, the land of Israel. And again in Shira Shirim, uh, uh, God is the, uh, resembles a crown of beauty, a teret tzvi. Okay. In modern Israeli culture, the gazelle is a symbol of grace and speed and the beauty of nature. Uh, it's celebrated uh, by the Israeli post office and by war memorials such as the Hatzvi Israel Memorial uh, next to uh, the kibbutz uh, Ma'alea Hamisha and also by the SPNI. Uh, it's uh, featured in uh, our homepage. Uh, although once common throughout the entire Levant, Israel remains the less significant stronghold for the mountain gazelles. Uh, to understand why, uh, we need some historical background. Okay, uh, this is a graph in which you can see the mountain gazelle population over the last century. Uh, the crisis began during World War I, uh, during which both sides of the world provided the thousands of firearms to different groups in the Mediterranean. And after the world ended, these firearms were aimed at the wildlife. And many animals, including uh, the Yachmu, fallow deer, uh, bears, and cheetahs, which once uh, roamed the, the land of Israel, uh, went extinct during that era. However, however about uh, 500 gazelles uh, managed to survive into the 1940s. Uh, the birth of the state of Israel in 1948 uh, brought to the Middle East the first effective anti-poaching enforcement. And unlike uh, populations of mountain gazelles in the rest of the Levant, uh, the gazelles in Israel uh, managed to survive the first half of the 20th century. Uh, another crisis came in the form of uh, a hoof and mouth disease outbreak in the 1980s, from which the population has been slowly recovering for several decades. Uh, however, now uh, the increasing number of people in Israel necessitates an upsurge of urban development. And once again, the gazelles of Israel are facing a crisis. Uh, now, the main threats to gazelles of Israel are uh, poaching, illegal hunting, uh, predation by feral dogs and jackals and mainly habitat loss and fragmentation. The increase in the fragmentation uh, of their habitat in Israel has shattered much of the population of uh, the gazelles of Israel into small and isolated populations. Uh, as you can see, most of the populations in uh, Jerusalem mountains uh, are located in the red or dark red uh, areas, which mark a low to very low connectivity. Uh, one of these populations lived in the midst of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, this is Pri Har Valley. Uh, it was once part of an ecological co corridor passing through the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it was the major part of the habitat of a group of gazelles, which were free to roam into the valley and uh, from it to the neighboring uh, Jerusalem hills and mixed with adjacent populations. In the early 1990s, the construction of the Begin Highway uh, trapped a herd of about 40 to 50 gazelles inside uh, the valley, which was now part of an increasingly hostile urban environment. Uh, from this moment on, these ga as gazelles were cornered, and during the 20 years following, the population fended into the brink of vanishing. Uh, the growing amounts of trash and discarded food in the city streets subsisted a dense population of jackals, you can see on the left, and uh, feral dogs, uh, both of which uh, consistently chased the uh, 
dozens of gazelles into the highway and which they were uh, hit by cars and they usually die. Uh, Prehar Valley remained as the last major nature site in this part of Jerusalem, but in the late 90s, it was designated for further urban development. And both humans of the gazelles of the area were now facing the loss of their only available piece of nature. Oh, Omer, and, uh, please, please try to talk a little slower again. Ah, I'm so sorry. Okay. You were better and you sped up. Okay. So it was that the uh, Prehar Valley was designated for uh, further urban development. And both humans and gazelles of the area were now facing the loss of the only available piece of nature. And the gazelles seemed to be doomed. But the human neighbors would not give up. For almost 20 years, the citizens of Jerusalem fought to save the valley. Uh, they, along with the SPNI, renamed it Gazelle Valley to mark that the struggle was also fought on the behalf of the wife. And eventually the struggle of the, the people of the surrounding neighborhoods was what drove the decision to turn the place into a nature park in which the gazelles will be protected. The Gazelle Valley Park was made by the community and for the community. It is open, as Jay mentioned, all day, every day of the week for free. It also offers educational and cultural activities uh, free of charge. And uh, one of the main strengths of this park is its availability to members of the public who cannot usually access nature conservations and natural parks. Uh, Jerusalem has the highest poverty rate of all cities in Israel, and many of its inhabitants rely on public transportation. It does not usually allow them to get into remote uh, uh, nature reservations. Uh, additionally, Orthodox and Hasidic Jews of Jerusalem cannot use any means of transportation during the weekend. And the Gazelle Valley being inside the city of Jerusalem and having no entrance fee for, provides a, a necessary system services to these sectors and aims to educate and include them in conservation efforts, specifically regarding, regarding the mountain gazelle. Speaking of which, now that their habitat was secured, a gazelle Valley Park was tasked to rehabilitate in its gazelle population. The first task was to protect the gazelles from predators and the highway which killed so many of them. A full perimeter fence was dug two feet into the ground and protected the gazelles from predation. And the entire perimeter, perimeter has been patrolled two times a day to ensure the fence was secure. But by the time the park was established, there were so few gazelles remaining that these protections just weren't enough. Every, every year in Israel, several funds are stolen from the wild by poachers and raised for slaughter illegally. Ten gazelles who suffered this fate were confiscated by the Israeli nature in the early 2000s by, by the Israeli nature and park authority. Uh, so these gazelles, once rescued from the poachers, uh, lost their ability to survive on their own in the wild. Uh, but the protected environment of Gazelle Valley Park provided them with a rare chance to live a normal life in which you will be free and safe. This small population was enabled us to stabilize the population, which after five years of rehabilitation regained its form of size of 50 gazelles. Uh, but what happened next would have been just unbelievable, just a couple of years early. Uh, as you can see, this is the plot of the population size growth since the formation of the park in 2015. Instead of just stabilizing, the population of gazelles just kept on growing. And in the spring of 2020, the population surpassed its original size, incredibly displaying exponential growth and going towards overpopulation. Now, I'd like to digress for a bit and talk to you about a concept in ecology called metapopulation. In a natural, well-connected environment, a population such as this in Gazelle's Valley uh, with a high fertility would function as a source population, uh, out of which animals would migrate and support populations that are not sustainable on their own. Uh, this process forms a net of small populations or subpopulation which support each other, called the metapopulation. As we discussed earlier, the severe habitat fragmentation in central Israel isolates the gazelles into these small populations, but they cannot support each other due to the fragmentation and roads separating them. Uh, when we consider how to avoid overpopulation, we were first pressured towards using standard procedures from uh, zoos, such as well, sterilizing. Can you please slow down again? <laughs> I'm so sorry, okay. Uh, when we first uh, uh, considered how to avoid uh, overpopulation, uh, we were pressured uh, uh, to use the standard procedures from zoos, such as sterilizing. Uh, but eventually, 
All involved parties were convinced that we must not waste this opportunity provided by the high breeding success of the gazelles in the valley. Thus, the reintroduction program was born. Using mathematical modeling based on the breeding patterns observed in the park, we estimated that our population can provide up to 25 gazelles per year and remain stable. Uh, okay, so all we had to do is to catch 20 to 25 gazelles per year and release them into the wild. Well, it was actually not that simple. Catching the gazelles is the most complicated task we faced so far. Mountain gazelles can run to speed of up to 45 miles per hour. A grown male can leap over 6.5 feet high obstacles and can spot a potential predator from miles away, uh, which makes capturing them very problematic. During the dry season, gazelles were searching for water and green vegetation. And our plan was to lure them into a pen by watering it, providing the gazelles plenty of green grass to eat. Uh, we also scattered around some uh, gazelle sticks, uh, like apples, uh, which seemed to do the job. Okay. It's, uh, sorry, it's supposed to be a video. Okay. Uh, as you can see, this is me and my partner, the flat. And uh, uh, once uh, the gazelle enters the enclosure, uh, Avishan, uh, which also works with us on the gazelle introduction, will close the gate. And after the gazelle is safely closed inside, uh, the veterinarian can uh, administer uh, sedatives using a dart. Okay, so uh, the main issue we faced after we managed to get the gazelles to enter into the pan uh, was the term, their determination to get out. And now watch closely. You see that? That's the gazelle's tail. Uh, this uh, grown man actually jumped over a seven feet high wall. Uh, so we had to uh, extend the height of all of the fence to eight feet, which also wasn't enough because uh, some males managed to jump over that. Um, now, another problem with uh, uh, the pens was a condition called capture myopathy. It's very common uh, when trying to relocate and uh, sedate uh, large mammals. And it's basically a very acute stress response that in the worst cases can kill the animal. And the process of capture in the gazelle in the pen was very stressful for them. So uh, we are now experimenting with darting them out in the open. Uh, the main difficulty with this method is that once the, we dart the animal, it will usually run away and we risk not being able to find it after it falls asleep. Oh, uh, no, this problem- Please slow down again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I will repeat. So we are now experimenting with darting them out in the open. And uh, the main difficulty with this method is that once we dart the animal, it will usually run away and risk not being able to find it after it falls asleep. Uh, so uh, we had to harness some uh, advanced technological solutions. Uh, we first tried using drones. Uh, as you can see in the video, uh, during one of our capture attempts, uh, this is uh, a bunch of the gazelles. So when we attempted to shoot uh, an arrow at one of them, immediately scattered, uh, avoiding the arrows and running away. And uh, we also have to, have to examine some uh, more advanced solutions in the future. Now, assuming the gazelle was successfully sedated and located, uh, we will proceed to transport it to its destination site in the Golan Heights and wake it up with, with the antidote. And now you'll see one of uh, the, the head veterinarian of uh, the Israeli Nature and Parks Authority, Ronnie King, and he will administer the antidote and we'll see how the male gazelle wakes up. You see that? This is Avishai, my partner. Okay, but our job does not end there. When we release an animal into the wild, we must choose between two options. And the default is hard release, straight into the wild. The animal can be released anywhere and there is no infrastructure needed in the destination site. However, uh, the Golan Heights, unlike the Zell Valley, is a host to dangerous predators, uh, such as the local uh, uh, wolf subspecies you see here. And a disoriented gazelle who is still recovering from sedation and a long car ride inside the crate has a much lower chance of surviving its first night in the wild. 
And so what we used is a called soft release. And we, we released the animal into a pen in the destination site, usually a very large one, in which it will acclimate for uh, several days. And when it's uh, fully recovered from the journey, we will release it into the wild. Okay, so now it's the highlight of the presentation. This is uh, the best released uh, video we issued so far. There it goes. Now, this uh, athletic young male uh, was captured uh, just a week ago in the park. Uh, some of you may notice the, the green uh, ear tag, uh, which is one of the methods uh, we use to uh, uh, monitor the gazelles after they're released and uh, check uh, how well the reintroduction uh, is uh, going along. Now, what you see here is uh, the acclimation pen in uh, the Gamla Reservation in the Golan Heights. Uh, all of our gazelles so far were introduced there, mainly because this is the uh, only available uh, facility uh, so far uh, to uh, host a gazelle for a couple of days safely and uh, has a staff monitoring. Um, now here by the crater, you see two of uh, the girls doing a nation, their national service in the Gazelle Valley Park. Now the first day, uh, uh, to, uh, to national service uh, people who uh, tagged along to a release and uh, are visibly though in a slow motion excited. This is uh, very much the highlight uh, of our efforts. Okay, so uh, we covered the mountain gazelles and their significance and uh, their endangerment and how Gazelle Valley Park came to be and how we got to a point where we're introducing gazelles into the world. Uh, as uh, Yael mentioned, uh, we, so far we managed to release seven gazelles into the world. And then now I will tell you about our plans for the future of this project. Uh, perfecting the capture process, establishing the multiple release destination, creating a long-term monitoring program and reintroducing over 200 gazelles by 2032. Okay. Now, every single relocation attempt is an expensive and difficult operation, and it requires the joint effort of specially trained staff and a veterinarian qualified to safely work with a very sensitive wild animal. We plan on focusing further efforts of capturing gazelles outside of the fence in order to reduce the stress experienced by the animals as much as we possibly can. And this method, however, requires uh, some advanced technological tools, including drones, radio transmitting darts, and the use of advanced software to allow the drone to track and locate the sedated gazelles in the sort of shortest time possible. And another avenue we examined is developing a mechanism that will allow the veterinarian to shoot the, sedate, the sedative dart directly from the drone. Okay, establishing multiple release destination. So far, all of the gazelles were reintroduced in the Golan Heights. However, to have a real conservation value, we must support the small and fragmented populations uh, in the central Israel. To maximize the gazelle's chances of survival, we will need to set up uh, multiple soft release pens in several destination sites. Okay, now to create a long-term monitoring program, uh, we have to uh, G uh, equip gazelles with a GPS transmitter. Now the biggest impact this operation can have is to set a precedent and form a method of sustaining the fragmented populations of large animals such as these. And to do that, we need this ability to monitor the survival and the reintroduction of the gazelles and quantify their contribution to the sustainability of the recipient population. Uh, so far, we are only able to equip four of our gazelles with transmitters, which limits somewhat our ability to estimate the success of this operation and its viability for solution for fragmented populations. And now in the next 10 years, we aim for this program to make a substantial difference, stabilizing the most vulnerable populations of gazelles in the urbanizing Israel. And the natural areas within the urban environment are generally regarded by the scientific community as low quality and of minor, minor ecological value. 
This experimental program, if successful, can redefine the way communities and urban nature factor into conservation. This project, however, is just one part of our larger mission of connecting the local communities with the conservation of nature surrounding them. This project already attracted the attention of Israeli media, which allowed us to continue in raising awareness to the plight of the mountain gazelles, preparing the ground for the required policy changes which are necessary to save this species and conserve Israeli nature. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Omer. Yeah, Al. Thank you, Omer. So um, this is a very exciting moment for all of us. We've been waiting for this moment, um, I think four years uh, since we saw that we're actually managing to enlarge the amount of uh, gazelles inside the park. In the beginning, we were not even sure that we can grow above 11 uh, gazelles that were brought to us uh, from imprinted gazelles from, uh, um, from outside the valley. Um, so it's very, very exciting. Uh, it's the first time a project like this is um, done in Israel. Um, as you heard from Omer, it's, uh, it's very, it was very difficult. And we, we had a lot of, uh, we tried in many ways and for a few years. And this year we've managed uh, to succeed. Um, to get uh, to understand how it could work and how it could be a success of releasing gazelles. Um, there was one question about the ear tags. Um, so the ear tags are not, don't have GPS, but they can allow us um, to watch the gazelles from the distance and to identify the, the gazelles that were brought from Gazelle Valley Park. Um, I didn't see if there were other questions. Jay, did you uh, notice? Yes, if we're already going into questions, Yael, uh, we already have we have a lot of time left on this webinar. Omer, you could have slowed down quite a bit on. Uh, Omer um, was very excited. Presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, it was exciting. Uh, it is. It is exciting. Um, let me uh, look. Peter Dratch, who's with us today. Peter is a. Uh, from his LinkedIn, he's an endangered species program manager and a senior biologist at US Fish and Wildlife Service. And Peter has a couple questions. Um, one of them in the chat is, uh, Omer, with these extreme population bottlenecks, are you monitoring genetic loss through drift and inbreeding? And I believe his related question in the uh, questions and answers, let me just get to that, because I think it's, oh, it's here. Uh, Avi has closed it here. Um, um, Pete, yes, how are we genetically monitoring the populations given their relatively small size? Um, yeah, this is a major problem for gazelles all throughout Israel. Uh, as I showed you in the graph, uh, the entire population uh, went through a severe bottleneck uh, about uh, 70 years ago. And uh, there's uh, several things that uh, the, uh, the nature and the parks authority does in the grander scale, and including the uh, one uh, research that came and that uh, went out mapping uh, the genetic difference between populations. And now regarding specifically inbreeding depression, uh, our uh, main way of dealing with that is uh, reintroducing into the gazelle valley uh, fresh blood. And, uh, additional individuals uh, once every couple of years. Uh, just a standard procedure in a captive population or an isolated population. Uh, we do not monitor directly uh, in a genetic, genetic state within the gazelle valley uh, during this point. It's definitely something we plan to do in the future. Uh, in the grander scale, it's a difficult thing to manage uh, when we were facing uh, many of the uh, small populations. And so far, uh, the policy in Israel uh, was to monitor them closely and see if there are any visible signs of the inbreeding depression, uh, which is uh, maybe a bit questionable way of dealing with this situation. Uh, but this is, this is very much one of the problems we want to address with this program. Uh, our gazelles, uh, the uh, eight uh, individuals 
and it was part of the uh, population that uh, started up uh, this current uh, uh, population uh, we have in the valley. Uh, it came for all, uh, from several points in Israel, uh, some uh, very diverse group of uh, gazelle that you were introduced into the park. And we estimated the heterozygote uh, in the gazelles in the park to be relatively high. However, uh, uh, as you can uh, probably gather by yourself, this is not an issue that was fully addressed so far. And it's definitely one of our plans for the future, both in our uh, population and in target populations. Oh. Uh, I hope I answered it. And okay, I think you answered that well. Uh, Peter, you could be in touch with us uh, afterwards or throughout. And uh, I understand you're in Colorado. Um, you know, maybe we'll get out there someday in uh, one of the trips to the States. Um, um, we, you already answered the question, Yael, the modern Hebrew word for gazelle, it is in fact the same as the biblical word. Not all animals mentioned in the Bible do we call by the same names today, I understand, but the gazelle, the, the Tzvi Israeli or Tzvi Eretz Israeli is uh, the same one the Bible refers to. Uh, yes, and Omer, that was a great slide about the uh, iconic depictions of the gazelle from, uh, from, from when? When were the earliest uh, wall paintings, cave paintings? Uh, those uh, those uh, rock carvings are actually disputed. The earliest estimations for uh, their age is uh, prehistoric, uh, prehistoric, over 10,000 years, but there are some uh, experts that insist they're relatively new, even uh, several hundred years old, just done by a Bedouin herdsman. Oh, so, really? Uh, Interesting. It's a very hard thing to date a uh, rock carving because it's not inside the cave. It's a rock carving done on a rock in the open, sur uh, open surface of uh, Mount Negev. Uh-huh, very interesting. Um, okay, um, moving on, we have a bunch of questions here. Uh, Yael, uh, does our organization provide food for the gazelles in the park? I mean- okay, So we don't provide food to, for gazelles in the park. They, they eat from nature, for what, from what grows in the park. Uh, the whole ecological system is managed in a way that nature, what, what nature brings is enough for the gazelles. And it means that the ecological system is actually working. Um, we, we do it on purpose. We don't want to make the gazelles um, get close or uh, to adjust to the fact that they're uh, near people, human beings, because we would like to have the possibility to go on and release them to nature and have them survive while they, they leave uh, the park. So we try to make it as natural as possible. Right. So in other words, the answer is yes, we feed the gazelles in the sense that the vegetation that we plant and the water systems that we manage provide nourishment for the gazelles as they do for migrating birds and, and other uh, animals who live in the park. And by the way, as we do at all our birding sites, uh, where, for example, uh, a kilometer away at the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, the Neely and David Jerusalem Bird Observatory, we planted uh, trees and uh, vegetation and uh, water plants specifically to attract and uh, nourish uh, migrating and uh, resident birds uh, as well I, as other animals. I, I would like to add uh, some something to the lecture that the problem of, of gazelles um, in Israel is not solved by this park being uh, a place that could produ produce a gazelles to nature. They still have a lot of, of obstacles when they leave the park and, and go to the open uh, areas because the open areas are um, still endangered in ways of planning and infrastructure and uh, uh, jackals and human beings um, behaving <laughs> in the wrong way to nature. So we still have a long way to go. Uh, it's just part of what we do in SPNI in order to save the, the Israeli gazelle. So it's very important to say that here when we're sitting in a webinar of SBNI. It, thank you, Yael. And I would go one step further than that. It's the very fact of having the Gazelle Valley Park in the center of Jerusalem and accessible to Jerusalemites on foot and open dawn to dusk seven days a week, uh, attracting you know human mammals from all the populations of Jerusalem. That is not just to provide, I mean, it's hugely important to provide 
uh, a place to relax in nature and take your family and enjoy and you know be sustainable that way but it's also because only you know when you learn to love nature do you learn to protect it and so we create activists uh, you know maybe out of every hundred people that visit it's going to change the life of 10 of them and and one of them will become the next Yael or Omer and you know devote their lives to uh preserving the gazelles and rewilding israel so you know it's the it's the it's the human nature interaction that's uh, also crucially important in this whole in this whole project um miroslav in uh belgrade asks about the genetic inbreeding again i think you pretty much answered that um uh um how do we deal with fragmentation another uh do we ever use in uh the fragmentation of genetic populations i think you addressed that omer uh, do we ever use artificial insemination to mix genetics? It's not common practice in uh, wildlife. Uh, it's not. Okay, it makes sense. Um, do gazelles have a language? This is an interesting question from Joella. Do, do gazelles have a language for communicating with one another? Are they not attached to a specific territory or a herd or tribe? That is, can you change location of an individual with no emotional effect on the animal? Um, that's a great question. Well, yeah. obviously there is some emotional effect. Now, regarding the, the way gazelles communicate, uh, there are several modes of communication. Uh, the main one is actually more of a body language sort of uh, communication. And you see it uh, mainly in aggressive states between males, but also between a, a female and a rare fawn, and you will see sort of uh, the way they approach each other, the way they uh, move their head, and the way they present themselves is a main way of communication, but they also have a, a vocal uh, communication from several varieties. And there are warning sounds. If I to imitate them, it sounds a bit like something like that. It's a bit of a small high pitch bug. Very funny to hear that. And uh, there are also uh, uh, sounds that uh, fawns and uh, their mothers used to communicate with each other, which is sort of uh, sounds like a bit like a small sheep. And now regarding the social structure, and uh, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, females and uh, their young fawn are usually in a, a, her a herd, a standard herd, uh, but the males are uh, in a separate social system. And there will many times be a territorial male uh, that will defend the territory in which, uh, usually uh, the territory in which uh, he will coexist with a herd of females and fawns, and he will keep out other males and will also uh, banish uh, male fawns when they reach a certain age. Uh, but uh, weaker uh, males can also be part of a, a young male herd, or a bachelor herd, we nickname it sometimes. Uh, and uh, what we uh, do when we relocate the gazelles is, uh, yes, uh, by the nature of things, separate them for their, from their existing social infrastructure. And it's a sacrifice we have to make. You know, the gazelle has to make, uh, not necessarily voluntarily, but uh, when we do that, we uh, both ensure the future of the, this specific gazelle, which will not be, have to be closed in in increasingly dense uh, population in the Gazelle Valley. Um, and we also provide them with opportunity to experience a vaster, uh, more interesting, uh, both social groups and territory. Uh, but yeah, obviously there is an emotional impact of Gazelles, which is really like it, even traumatic impact sometimes. And it's uh, something uh, we have to factor into account in every operation we do with uh, sensitive wild animals, such as these. Fascinating. Um, Murray Teitel in uh, Toronto wants to know how many gazelles died in the Jerusalem Hills forest fire? I guess he means the last one this past summer and uh, include the juveniles who died as a result of being orphaned. Do we know that number? Uh, it's a very hard number to estimate it. I don't know the exact number, but uh, gazelles are mainly harmed by the loss of their habitat from forest fires. They usually, unless it's a very young form, they do not get caught up in the fire. They're very fast and they can run from it very effectively. And once they run, they face dangers such as running into traffic and of course losing their habitat and then adjusting to a new territory, which is always difficult. 
Um, but because of those uh, attributes of the gazelles, it's very hard to quantify the damage done specifically to them by the forest fire. But most of other animals, smaller animals, who are caught in the forest fire will die instantly. Mm -hmm. and, and the juveniles, were there juveniles at the time of the fire? Did they, can they outrun the fire? Uh, so the fire was uh, in the late summer, which, um, early, early fall, um, which is not uh, typically a season. There are a lot of juveniles uh, around. Uh, most gazelles in the wild are uh, born uh, in between uh, the months of February and uh, May. Uh, there may have been some like in Gazelle Valley because there are plenty of resources uh, for the gazelles. There are a lot of food. Uh, they breed all throughout the year, but still the majority of the breeding uh, of the fawns are born uh, during the spring. So not a lot of uh, juveniles, but probably some. Okay. But Thanks. again, I, ha I have to add, being a regional planner, I have to add the, the, the fact of the um, ecological corridors being blocked by um, development and by planning and by infrastructure is a main issue for the gazelles with, when, when they have to run away from one habitat because it's, there is a fire or some other danger and they don't have another habitat to run to because they face a development or a new village or a road. This is part of the problem. When we block the ecological corridors, it's why um, we, we have this uh, species so endangered in Israel. Um, the development is so fast um, and we have to keep those, um, those ecological corridors open as much as possible. Um, I want to, to take this last minute to, uh, to thank the people who contribute uh, so generously to this project. Uh, and We've managed to succeed in this way for the last two years working on it very, very hard. Um, releasing one gazelle to the wild is about 2000 US dollars. This is uh, something we've, uh, we've understood just after two years working on this project. So um, um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to, to say thank you to the people who contribute. Thank you. Thank you, Yael. But you, it's not yet the last minutes. We still got 15 minutes on the clock and a lot okay. of questions to answer. So, We're still uh, here. <laughs> so let's move. But yes, the, your point is well taken uh, that uh, this is an expensive proposition and uh, all support is, uh, is uh, very welcome and we appreciate it very much. Uh, you can donate online and specify that you want to uh, dedicate it to the Gazelle Project or uh, contact our offices in Toronto or New York and, um, and be in touch that way or be in touch directly uh, through the mails that I send. But uh, let's move on because we've got a bunch of more questions and I guess we'll try Absolutely. to, uh, we'll try to uh, get them, um, we'll get them quick. Um, Miroslav in Belgrade is still interested in the whole genetic issue and he wonders, can we send the gazelles, export them to other countries? And I guess the opposite of that is can we import gazelles to keep the breeding uh, better? Is that, does that, is that a thing that happens? Uh, so the only other populations of gazelle, of this species of gazelle outside of Israel is in Turkey. There is a population of uh, well, 300 to 500 gazelles in the mountains of uh, Southern Turkey. I understand it's some not, of them are probably in jail in Turkey. Is that, is that not true? Mm -hmm. just, just a bad joke, so. Because we can uh, get them released. Yeah, well, they are not well researched, and we, we're actually not even that sure that the, this is the same species. It's still left to be seen. Uh, so, uh, if anything, the main uh, thing we may be able to do in the future is to export this species to countries from which it went extinct. It's okay. a bit problematic politically, but not as it used to be. And uh, once the, we establish the procedure, or working procedure, in which we can export gazelles on a regular basis inside of Israel, this is definitely a very promising possibility. Interesting. Um, and I would very much like for us to see that day. Well, actually Miroslav wrote that he read on Wiki Wikipedia that there are these gazelles also in Turkey, but we might be raising money to send you to the mountains of Turkey to actually figure out if they're genetically the same species or not. Keep, 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 uh, keep us, keep, we'll keep you posted. 
Um, total number of gazelle population in Israel, did you give a number, guys? It's about 5,000. Uh, 5,000. Yeah. Every year, the Nature and Park Authority does uh, a, comp, a head count of uh, the major populations. Mm -hmm. And very, very difficult thing to do. It's a very elusive animal. Uh, the gazelles of the valley are uh, much more uh, well acquainted with people than other gazelles. Uh, so we have a much easier time counting them, but the gazelles in the wild can run from a kilometer across and uh, it's very difficult to count them. Uh, so it's a, a minimum number of 4,000 and the actual estimate is about 5,000 mature individuals. Okay, um, listen, Murray is confused and I have to admit it is confusing. He said the science is Gana Tzvayim, but wouldn't that mean that the singular of that would be Tzav? And isn't that mean turtle? We actually What's have many tortoises in the, in the valley. We do have uh, turtles, yes. We have a whole turtle we rescue. We had a webinar about turtles. We did. <laughs> we did a turtle rescue center there. Right. Um, yeah. um, Hebrew is a bit tricky like that. <laughs> and the singular is Tzvi, the plural is Tzvaim. Uh, there's not much sense to it. And the plural of Tzav is? Sabim. Tzav is a turtles. And the plural for Tzav is Sabim. Sabim, okay. It's without an Aleph. <laughs> right, right. Okay, um, Dan Pava, our um, uh, board member in uh, in Santa Fe that Dan Alo and I just visited, hello, Dan Pava. He asked, could you, and this is very important, and uh, we haven't talked enough about, I, I, I brought up the, the the human gazelle interaction in the park. Can we, can you have an estimate, Yael, about the number of visitors to Gazelle Valley Park as compared to other Jerusalem attractions? And what percentage of visitors are local Israeli uh, or local in Jerusalem compared with people from around the country or around the world? So definitely I can talk about that. We have between 170,000 to 200,000 uh, visitors a year in wow. the park. Um, just to give you the, the numbers, um, the number of uh, um, the, the biggest um, park, uh, which is the Gan Chayot Tanachi, the, the Tanachi Zoo, has, which is uh, considered to be the most popular place, outdoor place to visit, uh, is 750,000 um, 750, visitors a year. Um, we're not a zoo. So we have a lot of people visiting uh, Gazelle Valley. Um, we know that in the Corona, um, we've raised the numbers um, in about um, 34 to 40% more people visited because it was open all through the corona, um, uh, except for the three, uh, the first three weeks, uh, the Gazelle Valley was always open. It was considered to be a safe place um, inside the 100 meters, then inside the 500 meters, and then, then in the, uh, uh, one kilometer that people could uh, go and then for running or cycling when this opened, uh, it became a very, very popular place. It also became a place uh, where schools um, could come and study. So when classrooms were closed, uh, teachers met their um, students in the Gazelle Valley. We had about 30 to 40 classes studying in the Gazelle Valley, um, regular classes. And now we've begun this year, we've begun a pilot um, with um, 25 classrooms coming um, each week for one day, outdoor, uh, outdoor studying in uh, the Gazelle Valley. So we have a lot of students coming to the Gazelle Valley, uh, working with us on um, materials, not only about ecology, also about uh, civil awareness, about um, historical issues, about biblical uh, uh, issues. A lot of uh, other subjects are studied in the Gazelle Valley, all related to how we can actually study outdoor. So this, is, uh, this became a very important place uh, for Jerusalem people and from people coming from outside of Jerusalem. Another fact that is very important to say that people that visit the Gazelle Valley are not like the one sitting in this webinar or people that have the money to buy a ticket to go to um, one of the parks that you have to pay 100 or 
150 shekels per family to visit like um, in one of the national parks um, because it's free. Everything is free of charge when in all of the vacations, in holidays, in Muslim holidays and uh, Hebrew holidays, uh, we have um, um, free, um, uh, free guides walking around explaining about the habitats, explaining about uh, nature preservation, um, explaining about climate change, um, and everything is free for the public. So what we have is people that are not used to get this kind of education, that are not raised on being green, um, getting um, those um, aspects um, every time they visit the park. Okay. Um, so, so I think it's a very, very important concept um, to mainstream what we're talking about in the SPNI, what we're talking about in, in Glasgow, and this is a way to, to get to, to the public that doesn't always get the chance to, to visit places like that. Thank you, yeah. And how big is the park? The park is 220 dunams. 220 dunams, so that's 50... 50 some, acres, yes. Some 50, 50, acres. 50 plus acres, okay. Um, and we're enlarging it now, actually. Uh, a new project we're doing with the municipality is adding... Uh, 50 more dunams to the northern part of the of uh, the park. Okay, let's try to answer quickly telegraphically. Any plans for land bridges over Begin or in general in Israel to help the gazelles move over uh, ecological corridors? I'm sorry to say still we don't have any plans, but it is um, it is our 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 biggest dream to to open this ecological uh, barrier. Um, I hope one day we'll get to do a webinar about that. Okay. Now, uh, I'll show you a slide for a bit. Uh, as you can see, this is the, uh, how uh, the area looks now. Uh -huh. And to bridge the gap between Gazelle Valley and uh, Jerusalem Hills uh, will require a project with, like which was never seen, particularly not in Israel. A okay, very that's not going to happen. Let's, um, let's move <laughs> on. We, but, you know, hopefully there are land bridges over, over uh, Road 6 and over uh, Road uh, 1 to Tel Aviv. So there's uh, been some movement on that. Um, other questions here. Um, I've lost my questions. Um, um, you, Omer, you talked a little bit about the challenges they face once they're released. Uh, you know, being run over. And uh, are there natural predators, by the way, somebody asks? Inside yeah. the valley? Yeah, no, no in, 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 no, not inside the valley, in nature, when they're released. What are their natural predators? Yeah, so many of the large quickly, predators- Quickly, quickly, natural is, predators. Yeah. Jackals, um, wild dogs, um, people. <laughs> in the Golan Heights, uh, wolves, and uh, sometimes wolves. hyenas. Boars? Yeah, okay. Um, you think they could outrun those things. Um, do we know how the seven uh, are doing that were released? Can, are we monitoring those exact seven? We saw we saw them um, um, in the in nature, um, thanks to the tags and in the and the ear the ear tags. Um, so yes, they're doing quite well. Okay, cool. Omer, quick summary of their life cycles. How long do they live? How are the young? How often are the young born? How many young per litter? And what's the age of maturity? Okay, usually one young or maximum two youngs per liter. Twins are relatively there. And they reach, uh, males reach maturity at the age of year and a half. Females can reach maturity at the age of seven months. Uh, the lifespan in nature is usually eight years. However, in captivity, can they can reach to 12 years. Cool, and a, and a female will give birth how often? Uh, usually once a year, but uh, in uh, Gazelle Valley, sometimes twice a year because okay. of their... Thanks. Uh, is this a national park or local? Uh, and what would be the difference? Yeah. It's a local park. It's actually a city park. City park. Um, if people know Jerusalem, it's it's a lot like Gan Sakel Park, which is the largest uh, uh, city park. But the the difference is it has nature and gazelles inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, and and a national park um, would be that's run by the Nature and Parks Authority. Uh, uh, falls under a different, but but base and and is run, uh, you know, similarly though I would say it's yeah, but it, you have to pay to enter. You have to pay. 
for most of it, right? But here, no, yeah, here it's right. Um, new and improved quarters, we're trying to do, we just mentioned that. Are there control over the number of people who can be at the park at one time? Good question. Um, we had over 5,000 visitors a day and it was great. <laughs> so in other words, it wasn't crowded? It wasn't, it wasn't like crowded. The, the gazelles know um, where to go when it's too crowded for them. There is the natural core that the gazelles uh, can run off, run off when they feel that the park is too crowded and the people stay in the other two thirds of the park, which are not the natural core. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, Jay, there's one more. Uh, sure. What happens when the animals go out of the park? Not sure if they mean if they escape the park or if they are released. So in either way. Yeah, I think, I mean, Omer talked about that briefly. Uh, I think I took it to mean the released animals and they face all the dangers that he mentioned, but Omer, you go ahead and, uh, you know, what If you're what talking happens? about the released animals, so we choose like very carefully the areas they release to, uh, but yeah, mainly the initial disorientation that makes them vulnerable to predators and other dangers. Escape from the park is not something that happened during its existence. Okay. So I saw one important question. The park is open seven days a week. It keeps Shabbat for the religious uh, people. We have a lot of religious people coming after Bet Knesset on Saturdays uh, enjoying the park. And the only day it's closed in the year, it's Yom Kippur. Okay. Every other day it's open. Listen, From 6.30 uh, a.m. to uh, sunset. So we're going to wind up in a minute or two. I'll make another comment here. Dan Pava mentions, and I mentioned this to you, Yael and uh, Omer, that, uh, and you know, I know you believe this as well. Uh, if this can be done in Jerusalem, then think how it can be replicated in cities around the world as part of, you know, urban greening of these areas. And he says, this is an example that should be mentioned in Paul Hawkins' regeneration website. I'm not familiar with that, but we will, uh, we will check that out. Uh, and Dan, keep us posted on that. Um, everybody's uh, thanking you, fascinating website, wonderful talk, call it uh, Some people even said that they heard, heard you very well, uh, uh, Omer. Uh, so um, <clears throat> really, uh, thank, thank you both very much. Uh, Avi, are we missing any major questions here? Uh, oh no, we've covered all of them. Okay, great. Well, thank everybody. I really want to thank you all for joining. Um, uh, over 110, 20 people here at the peak and uh, more on Facebook. Appreciate very much uh, everybody's participation, your interest in our work, uh, your support of our work. Uh, Omer and Yael are off tomorrow morning to do what they do, uh, returning the gazelles to the wild uh, and uh, raising them in this incredible um, nature reserve in the heart of Jerusalem. We, we highly recommend, we highly encourage everybody uh, to come see it if you're visiting Israel. Hopefully 2022 will be the year when there'll be full entry into Israel for people from abroad. And uh, really the Gazelle Valley should be one of your first stops. Uh, so please, and be in touch with us. You can show up anytime, dawn to dusk, but it would be even better if you let us know you're coming. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, somebody is there to meet and greet. And, uh, you know, hear what you have to say about it. So thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we will uh, be here again in three weeks um, with Iris Han, our CEO, talking about uh, Glasgow, climate change and beyond in, uh, in Israel and in the world. So uh, thank you very much. The Gazelles, thank you. Uh, Omer Yael. Avi, thanks so much back office there. And, uh, and uh, we will see you very soon. Signing off from uh, Tel Aviv, uh, Ramat Raziel and Omer, where are you? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the holy city, uh, home of the Gazelle Valley. Bye-bye. Thanks, Avi. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.